Former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, so good to see you, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, so much to ask about, and I want to start with the domestic political situation. Uh, of course, the Knesset is back in session, and that means with it uh, the status of this incredibly challenging judicial reform. And I'm wondering if you can talk to me about where you think that is going politically and the impact it will have. Uh, first of all, I have to make sure that every one of us understand what is this reform. What they call reform was defined by our Supreme Court uh, chief, a lady named uh, Esther Chayut. She defined it as a uh, attempt to crush the independence of the Supreme Court and to push Israel out of the family of democracies. That's not uh, just a reform. And to mention to all the audience that in Israel there is no constitution, no two layers at the, the House and Senate, something like this, no veto of the president, no filibuster, no checks and balances, nothing. The only thing that makes Israel a democracy, not a de facto dictatorship, is the fact that we have an independent, professional Supreme Court. That's all. One thing that I, of course, the audience also needs to know about Israel is that it's not a two-party system. It's a multi-party system. Yeah. And in that regard, um, does it mean as much for any executive to have control over the appointments in the judiciary as it would in a country where the, the parties and the governments are much stronger? In our uh, situation, the legislative branch is already fully, fully enslaved to the executive one. Uh, there is not a single law in the Knesset that can pass if it's not supported by the government. And the Knesset for years does not really oversee the actions of the government. So <laughs> we have only two branches. And even the one, the judicial one, is extremely fragile because it's based only on the independence of the Supreme Court. There is no other mechanism to uh, separate it or to put any checks and balances. Democracy should be uh, capable of protecting, defending itself against those who are using the very tools that it provides and the very freedoms that it bestows upon the people in order to destroy it from within. And against this, there is a spontaneous uh, civil kind of uh, resistance uh, movement that uh, comes cover all the leading groups of every aspect of our life, not just former judges, but former generals, special forces, uh, pilots in the in the in the air force and and uh, cyber warriors, and shrinks and academics and social workers and teachers. Everyone is against it. We already are uh, over four hundred thousand. It's equivalent, probably, of. Uh, 15 million Americans are uh, going to the street every weekend for 17 weeks now. Right, again, we're talking about, we're talking about 5% of the Israeli population, yeah. basically, yeah. on the streets every yeah. weekend in response. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a staggering display of, of social force, uh, yeah. this movement. I mean, not, Israel has seen nothing like this since its independence. Never, never. We had never seen something like this. It's, moving, inspiring. I am one of the people who are more harshest critic probably of Netanyahu and support this movement from day one behind the scenes. I did not expect it to be so powerful and creative. But despite the protests, I mean, you got a delay, but um, my point is that um, the state of this judicial, so-called judicial reform today is at least from Netanyahu's perspective and his coalition government's perspective, um, intended to still go ahead. Is that correct? No, they 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 delayed it. They don't have it. Yeah, they, they have delayed other it, issues. but they are now intending to go ahead with it. They they are not going immediately back. They have to pass a budget. Without a passing a budget in in four weeks from now, government is a, is a go out and there are new elections. So he had to focus on this. He had to satisfy his supporters for this unholy alliance that he created in order to impose this uh, legislation. Uh, so this unholy alliance, everyone needs his uh, legislation. And 
there might be some problems around passing the budget. This leader, um, he, he represents, you know, you call it an unholy alliance. It is, of course, a group of parties that together um, do reflect um, the will of um, a large section of Israeli society. I mean, they, they won in a democratic election. Um, they created a weak but nonetheless legitimate government. Uh, how is it that Israel, which has been described by many as the most vibrant democracy in the Middle East, finds itself in a position where this government, uh, not just Netanyahu, but with all the coalition members, are in favor of a reform process that would deeply undermine the Look, very institutions that it stands for. The, the regime change was basically hidden from the public when we went to the ballot uh, several months ago. Bibi stated before, during and after the uh, campaign that he will be focused on four issues or five issues. Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the uh, shortage of um, uh, housing and uh, cost of living, which is very high in Israel, and the governance, the, the level of uh, criminal activities, murders, and whatever in the streets. He doesn't do anything about it. The economy is on the verge of abyss. The security is a very sensitive, fragile situation. The relationship with the United States deteriorated and with the Jewish community as well. So there was never such a destruction of uh, value of, of, of wealth in four months. And uh, so, it was a kind of a clever tactic because you cannot come to the, uh, to the public and tell them, I want to save myself from a criminal court case and I need your support for this. No one will support it. So basically, it's a tricky behavior. Uh, so I changed somewhat what you said. It's a totally legal government, but it's clearly illegitimate government. The, the activity is to blatantly illegitimate. We say in Hebrew, there is a black flag waving over it. They don't have and cannot have the authority or legitimacy to uh, change the rules of the game and the, the rules by which our democracy is uh, acting. And you know, the best uh, example is the <laughs> demands of the pilots. They basically said, we have a, a contract with democracy. We are ready in a short call tomorrow morning without any every, uh, early notice to come and to, to fly over the, the skies of the, of the whole Middle East, risk our life. Sometimes we are bury uh, some of our, our comrades at the service of a democratically um, practicing government, even, even, even if we dispute their policies, including the policy behind the mission we are asked to execute. But we cannot and will not uh, uh, volunteer to serve any dictator or de facto dictatorship. How is it um, that ultimately this change in the way your country's judiciary runs, how is that ultimately prevented from being changed? What happens um, that, that stops this reform? Look. If Netanyahu will start uh, next week or next month or two months from now, it doesn't matter, he will start to pass those laws. They will be immediately canceled by the Supreme Court, even if the content of the law has to do with the way that the uh, Supreme Court judges are nominated. They will not hesitate. They will cancel it. They will cancel any such law. Once they cancel it, it's a, a clear a constitutional crisis with no constitution uh, because uh, what I call the, the gatekeeper, the head of the secret service, the head of the police, the head of the armed forces, the head of the Mossad. They might get contradicting orders from the, uh, their superiors in the government and the Supreme Court. And I'm confident that they will follow, I happen to know all of them personally, they will follow the orders of the Supreme Court. So the government will find itself paralyzed by trying to uh, change the regime. Bibi won't be able to turn Israel into uh, the de facto dictatorship. We are not Hungary, we are not uh, uh, Poland, and, and we learned the lesson from both of them. Yeah, Israel is uh, it's small, um, it's wealthy, um, and uh, its people are educated. 
uh, and uh, they're not complacent. Uh, so, I mean, that is, uh, those are obviously important things. So, you know, I think a lot of viewers in the United States, you know, they're used to whenever there are big demonstrations in Israel, they assume it's about the Palestinians. It's not about the Palestinians this time, but the Palestinian issue has not gone away. I'm wondering how you think about Israel-Palestine in the context of what is happening right now in Israel's own democracy. Uh, the Palestinian is most important, the biggest uh, elephant in the room, a mammoth. And we have other two elephants. The, the, uh, one of them is the relationship of uh, uh, religion and state. And the third one is the huge gaps in opportunities and results for Israeli kids from all sectors of the society. And I, this, I think that all these uh, uh, elephants, however important, and they are, they are not less important than the one we are dealing with, should be put on the shelf for the meantime. Because if Israel turned into the dictatorship, de facto dictatorship, none of this could be discussed even, not to mention decided. We, uh, a right-wing government uh, led by this unholy alliance will try to kill the Palestinian Authority to encourage the Hamas and hit them because they are good, so to speak, enemy. Everyone understands they are murderers. You cannot be expected to make any arrangements with them. And they will destroy everything, including the Abrahamic Accord and probably the relationship with Egypt and, and, and uh, Jordan again. So there is no way, and it's the same applies to, to uh, religious, uh, the religion, uh, the synagogue and, and the state. You cannot decide all these issues. You, we need the newly emerging line, a new line between those huge majority, including Likudniks and, and, and Orthodox people, uh, religious people and so on, those who believe in the uh, supremacy of law, in the values of the, uh, the, the, the declaration of uh, independence, which is our equivalent, so to speak, of uh, constitution and democracy. And uh, those people who are against democracy, against rule of law, against the, the uh, declaration of uh, independence, uh, under this new dividing line, we are the majority. We have to use it to translate it into political movement, into kind of a crystallized a constitutional moment when we will have an opportunity either to define a constitution or at least to have a basic law, heavily protected basic law about legislation, the rules of the game, the rules of the game, not the content, the rules of the game should be protected, secure, together with the charter of uh, human rights and, and, uh, yeah, and the rights of the individual. So. Last thing I want to ask you, Ehud, um, Israel just commemorated Memorial Day, and uh, you're one of the most decorated um, veterans in Israel history. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk just for a moment about what sacrifice means to you, and maybe if you have a story around that uh, that you'd want to share. <laughs> Look, I, I uh, spent 36 years in uniform. I lost many uh, friends of mine. In a way, I always feel as an adult that I'm escorted, uh, moving around me. Those guys, I remember they smiled when they were uh, 20 or 30. They were in many ways uh, better than we are. And I always remember Archibald MacLeish who said, we gave you our death. Uh, it's, it's upon you to give it a meaning, and it's upon us to give a meaning to the huge sacrifice. So we paid a heavy price for deciding to come back to the political arena, third time in our uh, three and a half millennia history, and uh, we are ready to pay the price. We pay it. But when you look at proportions, I just have uh, two anecdotes to uh, tell you. We lost in all the Israeli wars, 24,000 uh, people. 24,000 people are the amount, uh, the number of Jews that in November 43, in 24 hours were executed, uh, kind of uh, went to heaven in Maidanek. 24,000 is the amount of, uh, f of uh, prisoners of, uh, that were 
uh, uh, freed out of the Bergen-Belsen concentrated camp. After the breach, the American came there. 24,000 died within three weeks from, from, from the experience of having four years in the, in the camp. So basically, if you look at the proportion, we were in a better, better situation. And last anecdote. A few weeks before I left office as a prime minister, I was sitting in a in inauguration ceremony of new fighter pilots. And I noticed a, a, a woman, a young woman, a girl, walking between those cadets. So I asked the, the commander of the bases, who is this uh, woman? What she flies? And, and where is she from? He answered, she is a, a, in the next course, she will be inaugurated in, uh, in, in uh, four months. She is a flying F-16. She is one of the five best aces in the whole, <laughs> whole uh, court or course. And her name is Ronnie Zuckerman. It sent shiver into my spine. I told myself, here is all our story in a nutshell. Here I sit, the uh, prime minister and, uh, and uh, the minister of defense of independent, strong Israel, stronger than any neighbor a thousand miles around. I am the grandchild of helpless and hapless uh, Jews in the ghetto of Warsaw that uh, disappeared there, either in Treblinka or by typhus or something else uh, during the war with some of their children. I'm sitting here and in front of me walking uh, Ronnie Zuckerman, the granddaughters of Antek Zuckerman and uh, uh, Zivia, who came and, and fought the Gestapo for three weeks during uh, Passover of uh, 43. It's now exactly eight years after the uh, rebellion. And here uh, I see her and this, uh, this uh, young lady, she probably made a barrel roll 30,000 feet into the, <laughs> the sky with her F-16 over the kibbutz named after the warriors of the ghetto that her grandparents fled from, from the uh, terror after the whole ghetto burnt. Ehud Brock, thanks for joining us today. Thank you.